it is 6.30, so I think we should uh, get started. So I think um, uh, the, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And um, uh, I don't know of any changes that we need to make to the agenda in general. I know there's um, at least one thing we may have to do with the consent agenda, but uh, we'll deal with that when we get there. Um, otherwise, I don't think there's any reason to change the order or take anything off. Anybody have information um, to suggest we should? Nope. nope. Okay, great. Um, also, before we get going, I guess I, I just, this is my first meeting back after having a baby, and I am just thrilled to um, to be back and to, to be here with you all, and, you know, certainly love being a mom so far, but, um, you know, it also, like, sharpens, like, yeah, no, these are, there are things that are worth fighting for, for the future, um, and so it's just sharpened that for me, which is really good, um, and uh, I guess that's my my contribution to general business and appearances. Um, <laughs> so uh, general business and appearances, this is a time for any member of the public or the council to address uh, the group um, on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And so um, if you have something to say that is relevant to an agenda item, then you can say that adjacent to um, that item. Um, but uh, if it's not on the agenda, now is the, the right time to, um, to bring something up. Um, and as with other comments that folks may make uh, this evening, if you have something to say, if you would say your name and where you live and um, try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be very helpful. And then also, um, however you... Um, uh, it would be re it would be really helpful if you would change your um, uh, participation name, your um, name to whatever um, you well, really to what your name is, <laughs> so that we can have it for the public record, um, and also so that I can address you properly. Um, so that is, I think, all I have to say about that. Um, and I see we have one hand up already. If you have something to say, um, you can either. Um, uh, use the raise hand icon, which is under uh, reactions uh, down at the bottom of the screen. And, um, or you can turn your video on and physically just wave, or you can um, uh, turn your mic uh, or unmute yourself and then just let us know that you would like to say something. Um, so I think that is all I have to say. Whew, it's a lot of a lot of preamble there. Um, Vicki Lane, Vicki and Lane, I see you have your hand up. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Um, yes, I just had a question. Um, the um, water leak or whatever that's down by tractor supply, um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that amongst the various social pages and whatever. Is that, how bad is that? I mean, the road is pretty rough down there right now, but how bad is that leak? They've been trying to fix that for a while. Don't have any, um, don't have info right. on that, but if Donna or someone can answer that, that would be great. If not, we'll get back to you. Okay. I don't have any update as of um, an hour or two ago. It's just been an ongoing situation and we've also been um, out with multiple other water leaks. So staff has been dispersed across multiple challenges. Um, but I will ask um, our team in the morning and get that information back to the mayor and to Bill. And we can post um, some clarifications on our social media. Thank you. Great. You're Thank welcome. you, Donna. Okay, anyone else? Oh, Bill, if you are saying something, I yeah. you are muted. We, we got a note from Stephen Whitaker saying he was muted by the host and couldn't speak. No, if it's you're on a phone, fixed. you can hit it start. Just got fixed. I was muted and was unable to unmute, so I was trying to speak up. Okay. Um, well, so Jean Leon has uh, uh, his hand up. So we'll go with Jean and then, um, and then we'll go to you, Stephen. Go ahead, Jean. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
So I've had some uh, concerns from from public um, opinions. This limited public hearing by uh, this virtual platform isn't. I mean, not everyone has the capability to to meet this way. So I'm just wondering why why isn't the city building open at least with a camera or or if someone can't can attend or doesn't have the internet doesn't have a phone why has this been so restricted and limited to virtual world it's a question yeah thank you um i don't know if anyone from council would like to respond to that um i mean i can respond generally but uh, go ahead donna well, I mean, I'll just respond that when cases of the virus has gone up and to the point that things are more contagious, that indeed I didn't want to come to the city council meeting live. And it was also very difficult with the mask and to ask staff to be there if I didn't want to be there when indeed the legislators voted to allow remote meetings, they themselves are meeting remotely. So it just, it seemed to make sense. Um, no, I, I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense um, for so Jean, to, to people Jean, who don't have that accessible. Hey, Jean, this is um, not a time to responses, um, but thank you. My um, concern about, I guess, my health and also there were other council members who had issues with masks. It was really hard uh, to function. And so they were one of those exceptions of health. And I felt it was more important to allow all of us to have more freedom to talk right now than, than live. We did have all our public hearings live but that for at least the month of February, we were going to go remote, assess the data of where the virus was, and then make other decisions for March. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, right thank on. you for the thank question. Um, all right, and Stephen, go ahead. I, I wasn't, I wasn't. Yeah, uh, I wanna second the, uh, I, I don't have Zoom access uh, limited to telephone. I was locked out when I first tried to speak up. Uh, this is not adequate for public participation. The virus counts are falling. Uh, schools are relaxing, max mandates, et cetera. So the, the excuse doesn't fly. Uh, and we even have uh, the immediately prior council member taking votes by email to shut me out of tomorrow night's CVPSA meeting, uh, similarly. And it's just, it's just outrageous. But I want to raise a couple of other things. The water leak's been going on for five days down on East State Street, uh, flooding that storm drain. Uh, and there's just, you know, people put out cones and then don't move, don't go in there to fix it for several days. Meanwhile, the snow that piled up last Friday has still not been cleared from the very precious parking places on School Street. You know, we've got glazed ice sidewalks. We're really, you know, to manage or mismanage the, the snow cleanup while we've asked all of our citizens to park elsewhere at night so that this clearing could happen and then not do the clearing is really outrageous. You know, it's an exploitation of, of the power of the city and you're ripping off the public who's paying for this service. So I want to raise that, but I also want to raise a uh, significant, I learned that the city manager and others have been aware that there's million dollars, millions of dollars in road improvements necessary to use the new parcel that is being proposed on a bond. And that has not been warned, you know. So to ask the city, the city voters for $2 million bond and not disclose that there's an additional millions required to make that property useful by building a new road is, I think, a gross violation of the state law regarding bond and bond warnings. And I think y'all ought to take it really seriously, having just learned how expensive litigation can be in delays and in, in costs. So I just think that you, this is just another example, which I will speak later in the meeting about city mismanagement. Um, but this one, the council should sit up and take real notice. It was information known and withheld from the public regarding the cost of developing that property. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, just for the record, I have no information about the cost of the road. It's a city road. It's used. It's in use. Um, so I don't know where Mr. Whitaker is getting his numbers or where he alleges I knew something that I don't know. 
I have zero information about that. And certainly um, if we had hard numbers, we would share them. Um, so I, I have to believe he's making this up. Okay, all right, well, thank you. What is he making up? Um, all right, and is there um, anyone else? Hello. Uh, D'Anthony Butternut, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I like just joined. What were we talking about? I love D'Anthony looking fine. Oh, damn. You're my Wait, can you so, translate? Wait, wait. I'm sorry, Mayor. I think we're being. You're being uh, so like, bad. Yeah. I'm yeah. so confused, man. Hold on, let I'm me. A hacker. All right. I'm just going to leave. I'm sorry. I'm it's a Galazio. No. So Cameron, do you have the capacity to um regular city council meeting, y'all? Can I can I get my idea? Can I get my presentation? Um so Cameron, do you have the capacity to mute people? Okay. I'm working on it, I promise. Okay. Oh, I believe you. I apologize. I think I got everyone. Mm, no, not that guy. Okay, I think we might be okay. I will continue to monitor that. Apologize. It's what happens when we try not to um, put a lot of passwords or make more barriers to get on these meetings. And so sometimes that can happen. I apologize and I'm glad nothing worse showed up. Okay, now you should be able to unmute. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, if we right. see somebody pop in that we think um, is going to do that, hey, so how Vicky, can we let you know? Hey, um, so, so Vicki, even, even now, so we, we're just hoping to, for people not to, to talk out of turn. Oh, okay. Um, that's okay. Was, um, <laughs> but, cause, but, cause, cause um, I, saw I saw those, those two people. people. Yeah. Pop, fair pop. Enough. Um, it's a good, it's a good question, but, um, in, in an attempt to keep like some order, that would be good. Um, uh, I, I think you should probably just send um, Cameron an email. Um, Cameron, does that sound all right? That is fine, thank you. I will be definitely making sure people are behaving on the call. Okay, great, thank you. Um, anyone else have a comment they would like to make? Okay, all right, so we are gonna move on. Um, I, I had my hand raised, uh, Mayor. Yes, you've already had your. your I turn didn't get to finish because so. I was cut off and muted. Okay, so just so you know, Gene, the way we usually run it is that you like, and so that's fine. You can have your, you know, we can go back to you. That's fine. But for the future, future? Um, we usually go with it so that, like, um, if you have a comment, you say all of your your questions sort of together. I was muted. And. Well, so, yes. so you say all of your questions together and then um, when you're done, then we'll answer them. Um, so it's not like a back and forth. Um, so just so you know, that's, that's how we generally run this. Yeah. Um, I'll, tell but, you, I'll tell you guys roll and that's yeah, why that's, you just got so hacked go, in this virtual. So go ahead, I, Gene, now's, now's an okay time. Go ahead. Good. So look what just happened. You guys had got hacked, some intrusive, intrusive behavior. behavior. <laughs> Here we go again. I mean, this platform just doesn't work for everybody. Your Something's mom doesn't work right in now. bed after I try. Hello, I have a question. Something's happening again. I have with... a question. Just keep talking. I promise I'm fixing it. Okay. So I just wanted to 
make a note from a it's kind of a, a, a public collective request on um, and a suggestion and highly recommending that the council uh, to review the city manager's contract be thoroughly examined and and um, uh, it's it's suggested that it be reviewed and examined with an independent attorney um, so, before agreeing so Gene, or signing to any contract. Gene, I'm going to interrupt you. If you have sure. a comment that is pertinent to one of our agenda items, then you can make that comment then. Oh, right on. Thank yeah, you. That's okay. Was for, no worries. No worries. It's all good. General business and appearances is for um, comments that are on um, items that are not related to our agenda, okay. but but fair fair. Um, uh, we want to hear what you have to say. Um, I, I just I, I'm not, unfortunately I have another meeting, uh, so I just thought I'd say it. I just make okay. such suggestion now. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to, to have interrupted you. Um, I, uh, since you have to go to another meeting, anything further you want to say about that? I go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just it's it's to just thoroughly examine and review. You know, and it's and it's highly suggested and recommended that it be reviewed with an independent attorney, rather, or you know, at least extending the period of time to to undergo such review. That's all I was uh, saying, and it was like kind of a into a collective public request from from uh, you know people in, in, in neighborhoods and in our uh, community. Anyway, thank you. Um, have a great night. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm not seeing any other hands at this point. Um, so we are gonna move on um, to the consent agenda. Is there, um, I know, um, yes, Jack, go ahead. Move the consent agenda. Um, before we do that, uh, actually there was a, a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, and Jay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to recuse myself from item E from the consent agenda, um, which is the um, approval of the proposal for the Hubbard Park Trail. Um, the company is a client of mine, um, and there's nothing necessarily in place right now, but it could potentially be that I would do some work for them down the road on this project. So I just want to, I don't know if we need to separate that out from the consent agenda so that I'm not part of it. Um, but that's, um, I just want to make sure I'm recused from that vote. Thanks. So Jack and Connor, okay with you if it's, if you're, if it's a sort of friendly amendment. Okay, yes. great. Excellent. Uh, okay, so um, we have a motion and a second uh, regarding the consent agenda minus um, part E. Um, any further discussion on this? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, and um, is there a motion regarding item E? I'll make a motion, okay, Donna, that we pass the, uh, I forget the wording off the, the agenda, that we, that we award the, um, the bid to Timberland and Stone to do the ADA transition plan for our trails. Second. And is there a second? Okay, there's a second. Any further that's, discussion? That's okay. Timber oh, yeah, and Stone. Jack. Timber What's and Stone. That? Timber and Stone, I'm sorry. Did I not okay. say that right? I loved all the pictures. It was, a cool, <laughs> it was great to go through this proposal. <laughs> Okay, um, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, that uh, passes. And so we are up to some appointments. So we have this um, new committee forming, the Stormwater um, Utility Committee, um, and a, sort of a slate of folks um, to be appointed um, there, though to be fair, some of those are those folks are us, um, and uh, I think and so there's um, members from the um, tree board and friends of Lewinsky, 
Um, and one um, at large member of the public, and I don't see Jim Condos here with us. Um, I, I figure we could probably do both of the appointments together. The other appointment is um, uh, for Hanif Nazarali to the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Um, so is there, uh, and I don't see Hanif here. Um, either. So is there um, a motion regarding these appointments? Or, yeah. Uh, Jack, go ahead. I move that we appoint all the candidates without going into executive session. I'll Donna. Second. Okay, motion in a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. All right, uh, and so thank you. Uh, I know they're not here, but very grateful for, for everybody's uh, participation in these, uh, these committees and these groups. Um, really important and uh, exciting work. So very grateful. Uh, all right, so now I think we have a, a presentation from the Community Justice Center. Um, and so I see uh, Carol Plant here. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else, but uh, Carol, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, as far as I can tell, I'm the only um, the only one here tonight. I invited the staff, but they were reluctant. Um, so um, I first want to say I'm really grateful to be here. Happy to be able to talk about the Justice Center with you and give you an update. Um, I started right when COVID shut the state down and. Um, it's been a really interesting two years of like learning the job and learning the city um, because I don't live in Montpelier. So um, I'm really happy to be able to give you an update on where we're at right now and talk about um, you know some things that are pertinent to the Justice Center right now. Um, I am gonna share my presentation. So um, Cameron, if you can just allow me to share my presentation. Um, and I know that I need to do something to be able to get it to remove that sidebar. Um, hold on just a second. Run it as a normal slideshow, Carol. So just click slideshow and then from beginning. Okay. I'm um, yeah, having trouble finding where slideshow is. To the left. On the, on the top banner on where yeah. file is, almost to the all the way to the right. Yep. Other way. There you go. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. So I oh, am course. not not the most technological person. I will say that. Um, so again, you know, I appreciate being here, and um, I want to start off by just telling you a little bit about our staff. So I'm the director, Alfred has been with us for 11 years as the reentry specialist. So he does our um, our reentry program and our transitional housing. Erin Anderson was hired in September of 2020, and she um, replaced me, um, who had replaced Judy as the restorative programs coordinator. So she does all the panels. And then Pat Hoffman, um, Pat actually started out as a volunteer doing our COSA program years ago. And then she started doing calls um, to help out when calling people who were victims of crime and um, reaching out to them, even if there wasn't going to be a, a, an official charge. Um, so, she, and that job turned into a 12 hour a week position as our outreach specialist. So, we have a 12 member community advisory board. Um, right now, we're meeting once a month because in this two year transition period, we had a lot of attrition, which I think was really natural. People had a relationship with Yvonne and other folks at the Justice Center. Um, so we've had quite a bit of attrition, but we have a really strong board and we're meeting once, once a month right now instead of once a quarter as the group uh, forms and figures out what, they, what they, their roles really are and, and what they wanna prioritize uh, based on our strategic plan. Um, we have one member um, who is under 21, um, which is our goal is to have at least two who represent that age group. We have a total of right now 34 panel volunteers and 30 
COSA volunteers. So we have a really robust volunteer group in Montpelier. And um, one of the things that I have to say about that is that people frequently are reaching out to us to because they want to volunteer. They just hear about us. They, they um, seem to understand that we're doing really good work even before they get to know who we are and, uh, and want to volunteer. So we're not having to do a lot of recruitment, although one of the areas that we do want to do some recruitment is to be more diverse and have better representation of our BIPOC community. Um, just to give you a little bit about the restorative programs, um, we do 10 to 12 panels a month. And, um, and in addition to that, we do a, one or two youth panels. We have a specific group of youth are between the ages of 14 and 21. And so they mostly see, pre, they only see pre-charge cases and they see just youth, um, youth cases. Um, so that's a really busy program. The outreach to affected parties, it, it includes work that um, where there are people in a restorative justice panel case who've been impacted by crime. So Pat does outreach to those people and gives them options for whether and how they want to participate. And it's all about giving them voice and keeping uppermost in our mind um, what they want and need as, as reparations and resolution for what happened to them. And then she does direct outreach to affected parties, like I was saying, where there's no criminal charge. And we do that in partnership with Montpelier Police Department, where we have access to the records um, in their system. And she can make phone calls to folks and um, and just and, mo and mostly she will tell you that they just want to be able to tell their story about what happened. Um, and if there's not going to be a charge and there's not going to be any formal restitution or a court case, um, they just feel like somebody actually heard them, which is really important. And I think that's a really Im impactful program um, for Montpelier Police Department. The conflict assistance program is basically mediation, facilitation um, program, and coaching around conflict. And I manage all of those cases. Um, occasionally, we'll hire out an outside mediator um, if, if it's just too overwhelming or if I feel like there's any kind of conflict of interest for me, then, then I'll do that. We were pretty busy last year with those cases. Not so much this year. We've only had a few of those. I include in that also when I get contacted by, for example, um, one, a couple of the schools last year had some staff conflicts. And so I came in and I uh, did some mediation uh, between staff at the schools. So the reentry program is our circles of support and accountability. And that program, um, we use three to five volunteers. They meet with people um, who are who want this kind of support, people who are coming out of jail, who want some extra support so that they can stay on track with, um, and, and they have a laundry list of conditions usually that they need to keep up with, um, including taking care of themselves, which is finding housing and getting a job, maybe repairing relationships with family and friends, making uh, reparations in some way. Um, and then navigation services is people who are on probation who need a little bit extra of extra support, um, but not necessarily the full COSA team. So Alfred does all of that work. In addition to our transitional housing program, we lease two single occupancy apartments and we have people generally in there all the time. Um, and they, they stay between typically three and six months while they're getting on their feet and getting a job and um, you know, getting, getting themselves settled as they come out of incarceration. We also provide rental assistance to people who come out of jail and maybe have a job right away, and they, but they don't have enough money, for example, for a security deposit. So we help them, may help them find an, their own apartment and have their own lease and provide some assistance with them as they get going again. Um, we also do community forums and education. Um, right now, we have scheduled insights and insights into conflict, two hour, hour and a half, two hour program for the senior center that's going to be coming up in March. Um, and then we do also training and recruitment. So the training, we have standards that we have to meet 
for the Department of Corrections for all of our volunteers, except for CAB members. And uh, then we do ongoing training as well with our volunteers based on what they want and need for training. So just some of the statistics. Um, and I checked in, I, I didn't include 2019, but I did check on the data today just to see where, where we were at in terms of the numbers. And, and really we're in 2020, we really took a dive in, in uh, getting cases. We didn't have a lot of referrals because police were not policing so much when the state was shut down. And then the courts shut down for a long time. So there weren't, cases weren't being adjudicated. So people weren't going on to probation. And so we were getting fewer referrals and then it started to pick up. Um, and so we really are not too far behind where we were in 2019. Um, right now in 2020, things are a little bit slower. And this is a typical, I've, I've been, I've, this is my 15th year doing this work uh, between being here and in Hardwick for 13 years. And, and, and the, the referrals really do ebb and flow. And we, so you can see a year where referrals are fairly low and then the next year it will pick back up. So there's not a lot of um, logic to it necessarily. It's how, how crime might be happening in the community and other circumstances that are way beyond our uh, control. So the um, affected outreach for the panels, that's a really important figure right there. So, you know, there were um, 59, I believe that number, that's 59 cases where there were people who were affected by crime who were contacted and participated in our program, which is really significant because we want people in the community to feel like they have a way to have a voice in how a, a, an incident is resolved. And we know that when they go to court, there may be a victim's advocate that gets assigned to them, but they have very little say over how the case goes. Also, the direct um, outreach that, that Pat did, um, really significant numbers. So in 2021, 274 people. So far, she's connected with 92 people. And there was a glitch in the over the summer where there was a couple months where we didn't have access to the system. Uh, so she feels like she's probably going to be catching up with that. And then when you look at our volunteer hours, um, the volunteer hours in 19 were 655. So we any, we range anywhere in, um, in this figure for the panel programs. The reentry program, again, steady with our transitional housing. Um, the COSA program, we've, we had seven new in 2020, five new in 21, and the figures in parentheses are the total amount that we served. This year, 22, we have, we've had fewer referrals. Um, and part of, part of the reason that we have fewer referrals or we're working with fewer people is for one reason is because we don't have housing stock to put people in when they're coming directly out of jail. And then people are having more trouble finding their own apartment because of the issues around housing right now. Um, so hopefully that's gonna turn around. Um, we keep an eye on that and we think a lot about that, how we can best serve people. Um, but that's a significant problem too, because we have fewer cases to, in the transitional housing and everyone in our transitional housing also has a COSA team. So, um, so the numbers are a little bit lower in terms of the volunteer hours right now, which is a good gauge to, to, base, um, to base what's happening in that program. So I, I meant to say this at the beginning too. So if anybody has a question you want to interrupt me, feel free to, to do that. Otherwise, I'm open to any questions at the end. So current projects, um, I'm resurrecting the Parenting with Respect class that Yvonne had developed. We're hoping to begin that at the end of the month. Um, and we're working with um, our, one of our referring agencies, which is the Department for Children and Families, potentially for financial support. That's a program where we don't charge the participants because we want to make sure it's available to them. Um, Alfred participates in the Achieving Change Through Values-Based Behavior. That's another program that Yvonne was involved in. She took that program with her and operates that on her own. 
And um, so he's still in, Alfred is still involved in that, which is really helpful. There is a new program where we're doing, it's called Graduated Sanctions. It's basically to help keep people who are on probation from having a violation of their probation. So it's a restorative process so that they don't have a, a, court, a, a court hearing around a violation and end up going back to jail. So that's really just a restorative justice panel. It's a little bit modified from our regular panel. We're working with Northfield Middle and High School right now. We have a contract with them for six hours a week and Erin goes to the school and she is doing case, cases with students. And she's also working with their lead person there on systematizing their practices at the school. Um, Karen, excuse me, yeah. could, could you give an example like of what kind of issue they'd be dealing with at the school? Um, you know, that's, I don't know what she has had recently, but my guess is it is likely, um, it's potentially something like bullying and before it rises to the level of harassment, <clears throat> they will also use it. If somebody has a more serious infraction, they will use it as a way for them to be able to return to school after potentially having a, a suspension. So there's a couple different ways that that it gets used at the schools. That's a Thank good you. question though. I can follow up with Aaron and get some more specifics about those cases. You know, it just makes it more tangible in my mind. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, so we're also, also now negotiating with Harwood Union um, regarding direct referrals. So, so we've had a few meetings with them and they have been sending, they've sent six or eight cases to us in the last several months. And so because they're out of our district, we don't, um, we don't support them for free. So um, we're working on what that relationship looks like. And so we'll have a little bit of income from processing those cases. We were also contacted by Rory Tebow um, because he's interested in, in addressing equity issues for the BIPOC community. And he suggested um, a pilot project that um, he was kind of unclear about what he wanted, but he, he, he wants a way to make sure that our, our COSA teams and our restorative panels are more diverse. And so, you know, we're already working on that and, and also cognizant of the fact that we don't want to overstress the people uh, of color in our community by asking them to do too much. Um, so, you know, we've come up with a couple of ideas about um, acknowledging that there are disparities and then working toward making sure that we can offer people, if we have a person of color coming into our programs, that we will do our best to make it a more, a, a more appropriate and a more comfortable situation for them in terms of representation on their team. Um, let's see what's next here. Um, so always we're, you know, working with Montpelier Police Department. We have a great relationship with the police. We get lots of referrals and we learn from each other all the time. We've had some new, uh, the new officers that are, that have come on. We've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with them so we can explain our programs. And we really, with all of them, just want to stay uppermost in their minds so that they'll be ready to do the direct referrals to our program. So these pre-charge referrals are a real opportunity, especially for first time offenders to not have any, any connection with the criminal legal system. So if the case doesn't even go to the state's attorney's office, it's a, it's a really different opportunity than if it goes to the state's attorney where when it goes to court diversion, there actually is a charge. So, it's, so diversion is not pre-charge, it's pre-adjudication, but not pre-charge. So we have a relationship with Northfield and Berlin also send us referrals. And in the last couple of years, Vermont State Police uh, is doing referrals into our program, which is, for me, was really significant because I tried for several years in my previous job to have a relationship with Vermont State Police because there's a lot of coverage um, in Caledonia and Orleans County where I worked and that didn't go anywhere. So this is great. Um, strengthening our partnerships with the city departments, we do get referrals from a couple of our de other departments. The planning department occasionally will send referrals to our conflict assistance program, which is fantastic. Um, I've offered to just help people really understand how to what a restorative conversation could look like so that um, all of our city staff 
will feel like they can resolve issues before they get bigger. So uh, that's something that uh, Tanya and I have have to do have a little more conversation about, but something that is um, important. My goal is that the city be considered a restorative city. Um, the Montpelier Roxbury School District um, and other area schools, like I said before, we you know we have contact with them. They've been looking to us to help them with establishing restorative practices, and that's at all different different places right now for for different schools and different districts. And we also train uh, youth panel volunteers. We recruit and train youth panel volunteers that they can then take the training that they've learned for our community panels and bring it back to their school. We um, are always working on our outreach through events and marketing. We are required to do two community forums every year. One of them is gonna be the, um, the MSAC uh, Insights into Conflict. We haven't quite decided what the second one is gonna be yet, but it'll be something this spring. And then for marketing, one of our ideas is to post on Front Porch Forum some topics around restorative justice so that um, people remember what we do and, and how we do it and why we do it. Because we're in the uh, legislative um, session right now, there are a few things that are important to us. Um, that right now there is a midpoint probation review that um, would target early release for probationers and this could affect our graduated sanctions referral. So we're just keeping an eye on that. We don't have any um, objection to it. There's also a bill to remove exclusionary language that would then allow community justice centers to process domestic and sexual violence cases. Right now it is in state statute that we cannot do those cases. There would need to be a lot of work around training and figuring out uh, um, the most appropriate process if we were going to start doing those cases. That being said, sometimes through our process we do, and our reentry folks, there, there are often times where we work with sex offenders and we work with people who have committed dom domestic violence. Um, outside of that, with our panels, we would really need to have a process that was going to be safe. And so so there, there's concern around that one going through and not having everything in place uh, and and not we want to make sure that it's safe for the people who've been affected. There's a talk about an overall review of uh, the all of the organizations that provide restorative services around the state. And from my understanding, a study group has been formed, uh, I believe, in the House. Um, and then CJC directors, just so you know, we meet uh, once a month, all of us from around the state and talk about what's important to us, how we do our work, we uh, do education together, we provide restorative justice panel training together. Um, and we decided that because we have been level funded, I think Montpelier has been level funded for at least 10 or 12 years with our base grant, we decided as a group we had consensus that we wanted to ask um, for a 5% increase for cost of living expenses and to support full-time benefited positions. Um, whether or not that'll go anywhere, I don't know. It's really gonna be up to appropriations to decide how they're gonna fund the DOC and then the DOC is gonna decide what they provide for us. I did hear last week, we're hopeful that we will at least be level funded for for fiscal year 23. There is a need for updating the statutory language right now. Restorative justice centers are mentioned in a few different, um, in a few different laws and it is not up to date. So there's some uh, old language in there. The other thing that, uh, that is re really important to me and to some of the other directors is that we need an entity or a support structure to represent the CJCs, not just with the legislature, but in general, and my thinking about that is, you know, what this organ we had this organization for a while. It was called the Community Justice Network of Vermont. Our funding from the Department of Corrections was removed, um, I think, in 2018, 17 or 18. So we haven't had that organizing body, and we had an executive director who was able to really organize us and keep us organized, and we met regularly and. Um, 
we really felt like this was an avenue for us to advance restorative practices and how we do it and to bring equity from, from one county to the next and one justice center to the next. So I'm I'm advocating for that, I but we don't have the funding for it right now. So that's another thing that I have been asking for and have um, mentioned to my colleagues, and I know there are others who want that too. We're just not sure how that might happen. What could happen if that existed was we potentially could end up with a statewide database, again, bring equity statewide, could be an, uh, an avenue for grant seeking and more volunteer and staff development opportunities, which would be fantastic. And then lastly, um, support from municipally based community justice centers. There are only a, a few of us that are left that are based in municipalities. And the reason that this is important and I'm bringing it up is because in, in December of 2019, before I started in this job, um, there was a community advisory board meeting that the Department of Corrections attended. And what they suggested at that meeting was that the Barry Justice Center and the Court Diversion Office in Washington County and the Montpelier Justice Center should get together and figure out a way to um, become one nonprofit that would be the point, the point, uh, one point to collect all of the referrals for all of the work, all of the money and all of the referrals would, referrals would go to one place. So it does exist in six, five, in five uh, centers in five counties around the state. Um, but otherwise the, the programs are, are kind of scattered with different agencies. So it's, it's fairly complex. But there are lots of good reasons to maintain the municipally based community justice center. What I see in Montpelier in comparison to, to where I've worked before is that the justice center is so is really truly embedded in the city, um, in city government and in the city. I mean, people really value and, and appreciate what we do. They understand what we do. And there would be lots of um, Lots of negative consequences, I think. And in part, because most of our work is, is actually done by the volunteers who live in the towns that we serve, I think we would, I think we would lose a lot of the, um, the flavor and the, the intent behind what we do, which is to, to reconnect people in their community. And I think that's a really important piece of what we do is to help people really feel like they belong even after they've committed an infraction. So that was a lot, I know. Um, I could say a lot more if, if, if you know me, <laughs> you know, I could talk all day and, and night about restorative justice, um, but I'm open to any questions that you have. All right, thank you, uh, Carol. Any comments or questions um, from council? Oh, go ahead, Donna. Uh, Carol, I guess two things. One is uh, you use the term panels a lot. Could you sort of describe what the panel actually does? Sure. Um, it's it, between three and five community volunteers who um, they're trained in restorative justice process and they meet with the person who's committed an offense and who has been referred to us. And they basically cover four points in a community panel meeting. They want to deepen the understanding of the harm. They help identify who's been affected and how they've been affected. They help a person re-engage with their community. And then they also look for ways to have a plan for this person to do something different so that they don't reoffend. They come up with an agreement together and that uh, everybody signs off on the agreement and everyone who's in the room gets to participate in creating that agreement, including the person who had the offense. So it's a, it's a pretty egalitarian process. Um, everyone gets to contribute. It's really transparent. And then that person comes back after a couple of months. And if all of the tasks on their agreement have completed, they complete the process successfully. And the others were the initials um, C-O-S-A, COSA? Yeah, COSA, that's the Circles of Support and Accountability. Okay, it's an abbreviation, thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, Carol, I just uh, want to say I served on a COSA panel pretty recently and I uh, want to give a big shout out to Alfred on staff there. Like, mm -hmm. talk about a guy who, like, it's more than just a job for him. Like, the cell phone's always on and he, he's making a real difference in people's lives and just want to, just want to acknowledge that. It's Thank you. I really appreciate hearing that. And I know that um, I, I will say that the people, the people that I know who are really into this work, we're all really passionate about what we do. And, and personally, I feel like even our volunteers, like our volunteers change because of the way that they do the work. They really understand that they, they need to come to this with an open mind and an open heart and to recognize the people that they're working with as their neighbors and their, you know, people who live in their community. So really the engagement piece and helping people come back to feeling like they belong is, uh, is a really important component of that. And yes, Alfred is on top of it. Donna, go ahead. Only if there's nobody else, I, I just have a personal story. Uh, when the car hit me in the crosswalk uh, in Montpelier in 2016, I was so surprised when someone from your department, uh, Pat, called me. Um, I was like, I mean, literally, I mean, it was you're so alone with dealing with it. And to have somebody call you and be concerned about you as a victim was awesome. And we never got the driver to ever meet with me, talk to me or anything. But that was really very, very meaningful. And I do wish we could have used your services. I think it would have helped me a lot. So I'm glad you're there. I think that's a that's a pretty typical response of the people who, who participate as, as someone who's been affected. They really appreciate that opportunity. You know, again, in the court system, they may or may not have an opportunity to ask the questions, the unanswered questions through the court process. They want to, mostly they want to know why and if it was personal and and they want to have a say in, in what this person needs to do to make uh, reparations to them. Okay, we also would take uh, comments or questions from the public. Um, any Any questions or comments from other folks? Yeah, Steve Whitaker. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I just want to caution. Uh, first off, my radar goes up when we think about spinning off nonprofits because the transparency goes away when you're not obligated by public records law. But I also, I've done a lot of work advocacy, you know, uh, over the Girton Park problem and solution, uh, which is now worse, by the way. Um, and I was assaulted by one of the frequent flyers down there. And I was told by the officer who took the report that it was referred to restorative justice, but I never heard a peep, you know, and the guy's still carrying on his same belligerent behavior around town. He's one of the chronic problem people, you know, which might have been healed had he had safe place to stay overnight. Um, but I just got, want to caution that this, you know, you hear a lot of, you know, great stuff, but when, restorative justice ignores the victim of the crime, you know, and it's, it's, uh, you know, not to put all the history of this town's uh, mismanagement and police corruption on the restorative justice center, but I really do feel uh, that my experience is not uh, consistent with what you're hearing. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate your comment about that. I can't speak to why that might be. Um, there are, there are times when we don't get the referral, even if even if you were told that it was gonna go in that direction. If a person is not willing to work with us, then we won't get the referral. Um, and, it, and it also, you know, the, I mean, there are hundreds of cases that, hundreds of calls that uh, Pat looks at every month and she has to also pick and choose who she can call. Like I said, she works 12 hours a week, so there's only so much she can do. And this is another request that we had with, um, with the Department of Corrections was actually to be able to have a full-time benefited position to do the work that Pat does at every justice center. And um, we doubt that that's gonna happen because that was gonna be about a million dollars more to, um, to the justice centers. Um, but if we had, a full-time position as opposed to 12 hours a week, there'd be more opportunity to make those outreach calls. So I'm sorry that that didn't happen for you, Steve. Um, I, I, I don't know why, but. 
So that, that's a good explanation. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, anyone else? Okay. All right, well, oh, uh, Vicki, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. I just wanted to um, somewhat, but not totally. Um, my experience with the Community Justice Center was not all that positive either, um, but that's the way it was. I mean, the person was not, uh, um, was not, did not respond, did not care, did not respond to any of the of the communications from the community justice system. Um, but that's the way it goes sometimes. There are definitely people who are not ready to, to be accountable and accept responsibility for the decisions that led them to harming someone else. So we, you know, we can't really change that. If they, if they don't respond and they're not willing to work with us, then our hands are tied. We can't force them to do that. And it wouldn't work if we tried to force force them to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's really helpful to know how your processes work and that uh, it's sort of, in, in order for some of these processes to even happen, it has to kind of be a two-way um, street and uh, not always the case. Um, I also just want to express my uh, gratitude to you all. I think you all do just really wonderful um, work and um, to really appreciate uh, everything that, that you and uh, the whole department does. Uh, so please pass that along to, um, uh, to them for us. I will, thank you. Great, all right. Um, and so um, moving on then, um, unless there's other questions from from uh, council or comments from council. Okay. All right. So uh, moving on to uh, the police review committee follow up, and I think I saw Alyssa on here. Um, oh, and and Chief Pete is on as well. Great. Uh, uh, Bill, go ahead. Uh, just quickly to tee this up while people are getting on. Um, when the, when we last had the presentation from the police review committee. Uh, the council had asked, and I think the committee had asked that we revisit again in a few months to see where things were and uh, kind of get an update. Um, so that's what this was. We scheduled this for February. And uh, I think, I know the chief has was going to do a run through and I don't know if Alyssa is planning to do anything or not. Okay. Uh, well, I will turn it over to um, either you, uh, Alyssa, or uh, Chief Pete. Oh, and I think, uh, yep, okay, go ahead. Sorry, um, uh, good evening, um, uh, Mayor, uh, honorable members of the city council and uh, uh, city manager, and assistant city manager, uh, Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. I can go through the slide presentation and, and uh, pause any slides. Uh, uh, Alyssa, if you'd like to speak to them or if you'd like to go first or before, your call. Um, I think it'd be great if you could go, Chief Pete. And I did. I have been kind of going through and listing out some questions for you, and I wasn't sure how we should deal with that. But I'm happy to, you know, wait to the end and then go. Why don't I wait to the end so you can talk? Unless you're at a pause point, and then um, then I'll jump in. Sure. Okay. Then I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen, and then move to um, uh, to to start on the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, can folks see everything? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, again, my name is Brian Pete. I'm with the uh, Montpelier. I'm the chief of police for the Montpelier Police Department. And tonight, just going to provide you with a summary update of all of the, uh, the the action items that the police department has been involved in. What this slideshow uh, is going to be is just going to be a regurgitation of the previous slide presentation, but the updates will be marked in purple uh, for easy reading and uh, easy discussion. So this was the uh, the, the summer or the first introduction slide uh, of, of all the items that uh, we were going to discuss. And then this was the the, the second slide for that. Um, what I want to uh, call attention to is it, everything that was circled in red um, were items that uh, 
we had or that we were going to have uh, discussions about. But for the next slide, uh, for right here where it says city does not support when we circle officer misconduct or internal affairs, that's it kind of doesn't read too well. We do very much support um, transparency and accountability uh, with uh, with misconduct and internal uh, affairs, but it was more appropriate to move that to talk about the spirit of recommendation and flagging the challenges that uh, that come with a, per se a civilian uh, review committee and how that discussion should pan out. So that's where we need more direction or more conversation regarding that. Otherwise, everything else is the same. So in moving forward, um, what, we, uh, what we're looking at here on this particular uh, slide is um, for, for uh, any time that we have a significant incident, uh, an officer involved shooting or something where, where there's a significant uh, a use of force incident that uh, the PRC has recommended that, we, that, that there, there be some way of putting more information out to the public um, and then helping the public um, digest the information, ask questions, and, and look at the accountability process and the healing processes as well. So the police review committee has agreed to assist us in developing what that protocol might look like. Um, I also wanted to note that the Montpelier Police Department is about to implement a chaplain program in which we're reaching out to leaders uh, in, in our faith-based uh, community to see if they would come aboard and then provide um, counseling and comfort to those who may want it when uh, when we're responding to, to uh, traumatic calls for service or even for the officers, staff members and their families when they might need another outlet uh, in regarding to um, some of the things they may be struggling with at work. Uh, the second bullet point there, that update is that we have um, that our uh, CRO, uh, Corporal Philbrick has completed the IS-29. That's the Public Information Officers Awareness course, um, but he needs a follow-up course, and that's the advanced course. So we are still moving ahead as far as how we're disseminating and how we're professionalizing the way we disseminate information to the public uh, based on best practices and what other agencies uh, are doing and doing well. Um, but as a note, um, because of our staffing situation, uh, Corporal Philbrick has not been able to fully devote his time um, to the CRO, which is uh, quite honestly a, a, a full time job, even more than that. Um, so he's dividing his time working the streets and then covering other shifts that we can't cover and then coming in and hanging and, and, and handling these administrative lifts or making building these bridges with the community um, in between calls. So in looking at demilitarization, the 10 1033 program uh, to update that. What our recommendation is, and, and uh, is that if we're more than likely not going to look for anything from the 1033 program, we have not used it in years. Uh, I don't foresee us doing it um, unless there is something out there. The only thing that we may consider might be things like helmets or body worn or, or body armor, but Traditionally, when those things are offered through the 1033 program, they're often expired, so they're, they're no good for us. Or when we look at things like storage containers or like Connex boxes, uh, places that we can store some stuff outside because we have limited um, room in, the, in the, uh, uh, the department and office supplies. But again, I don't see us doing office supplies because the state has a surplus shop uh, 10 miles up the road. So we don't intend to, to purchase any vehicles, weapons, less than lethal items, anything else to that effect. But if we did want to seek something out for the 1033 program, um, we're thinking that it's going to be best prudent to reach out to Cameron and Bill, let them know which items we'd like to get, and then have that brought to the city, con uh, to the city council for any discussion. And looking at street outreach training, um, we have our annual CPR training that's going to be scheduled in the uh, first week of March, the first few weeks of March, we're going to incorporate the recommended training um, regarding de-escalations and, and, and looking at what signs of intoxication may be, or you know, if, if someone's drink, drank too much, or if someone has used uh, uh, another intoxicating substance, drugs, um, what those physical signs are, what the, um, and, and how that affects through the body and, and, and um, how it can be treated and th to those things. So we're going to incorporate that with our annual CPR training. And we'll of course, send the invitation out to our outreach partners and the CJC um, if they'd like to attend this block, which is something that they had requested during uh, the, uh, 
the PRC process. So training with youth and adolescent behavior, um, the, the recommendation from the PRC here was to look at, at, at cognitive development um, and how it works in juveniles, how it works in children. So we've reached out to Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, which is right up the hill near the, near, near the Elks Lodge. And uh, they're working to develop a specific course for us based on child and adolescent brain development. They're also going to talk about other topics such as how, how that development and how that physical development uh, relates to sexuality and children and teens. Um, I do know that there will be a cost. The cost is going to be about $500 per class. They're not, um, they're gonna be unable to do one class for us and we record it and then all the officers are trained in it. it it's gonna have to be uh, paired out uh, throughout a variety of days to get day shift, afternoon shift, and then the officers who are coming in on, on different days. So we're gonna, it's gonna take several courses to get that training done. My estimation is anywhere between three to four. For crowd control. So what we're learning as we're talking more about crowd control, it's actually crowd management. Crowd control is when it gets to the point that we can't, that, that the situation is beyond control. So we're looking at it more from a proactive standpoint. So we're going to end up, um, initially we thought the training was going to possibly run anywhere between 10 to $15,000. And then we were gonna to try to get a grant for that. Um, but we found uh, a good training opportunity and we're going to send um, uh, Deputy Chief Norrinson and Sergeant Moulton to training in Florida, uh, which is literally next month, I believe. And they're gonna be trained on crowd management techniques um, and preparing for uh, no notice things or things that, that are, are, are scheduled and how we can make sure we, we work to deescalate situations and start um, uh, compromising situations from occurring in the first place. So that training will be, uh, uh, those uh, the chief and the sergeant will bring that training back to the department and we will continue that training in-house. And that estimated cost is going to be uh, $3,000 that we'll be taking out of our training budget. So for scenario-based training, this is the previous slide. It's pretty lengthy, but you guys are already aware of it. Um, the updates are on the second one. So we have uh, gotten the uh, virtual reality training system through a grant from the Department of Homeland Security. We're in the process now of talking with uh, the state with DPS to deploy this asset to the, the training that um, cadets are receiving at the police academy. So this is something that we want to not just keep with us, but it's a good tool that we're going to bring out and we, we hope to do that with the academy. Um, we are committed to implementing mandatory advanced trainings that, that's required and obligated to us by the state, but we want to go above and beyond that because we want to be, well, be good at our jobs. Um, we're also looking at the PRC or implementing all the, the training rec, uh, requirements or recommendations from the, the PRC. But just as a note, um, our current staffing and budgetary shortfalls do present some obstacles for us to do immediate implementation for these types of trainings. We're not giving up on them. We just have to find uh, other ways to find funding and um, making sure that our staffing kind of kind of gets a little bit higher before we can move on. This is we'd like to move a lot faster than this, but we're we're at a point right now at a, at a choke point. Um, and then. As we talk about, uh, in the, the, again, the other part of that is, uh, is the increase in the administrative lifts that we have to do um, for, those, uh, for those particular incidences. But in, in trying to overcome it, as we're looking for grant opportunities and trying to increase our staffing, we're looking at out of the box thinking, such as like looking at a, at a reserve officer program where we might uh, bring aboard some folks um, who can serve or who can work part-time for us. And that would free up officers to go to the primary training. Uh, and then in uh, June, 2022, uh, we have uh, several officers that are scheduled for a four day less than lethal training uh, certification. And, uh, and again, as, as we've let folks know, advanced training options in uh, Vermont for law enforcement are, are scarce. It's, it's, it's a combination of many things and, and we're definitely not pointing fingers. It's just a, a perfect storm of what's going on. So we're trying to, again, uh, to, to get these advanced training options and to, to strengthen our department, to strengthen uh, the services that we provide to the city. Um, we're gonna have to go outside of the state, which is going to increase the cost of, of you know, more from our training budget. 
the mental health professional funding. The update here is that the, the new budget allocates an additional $45,000 for that 0.5 position. Um, so Washington County Mental Health Services are, is, are going to connect with members of the, the PRC to discuss where those funding priorities uh, would probably be the most effective. Again, our position, my position is that this is something best left to the experts who are doing these types of things and that the Montpelier Police Department will, will continue to work with our partners. We have very strong relationships with folks. So we're going to trust their judgments here and then look at how that's gonna be implemented and how we're going to best work with that. I, I really staunchly believe that mental health and law enforcement are, they have to be very, very close partners, but one cannot be embedded in the other. It's just, uh, it's just something that's just, it's not a good, it's not a best practice, only in certain situations when it's actually quite necessary. And we don't need that, that model here, in my opinion. So for street outreach capacity, the update here is that the city is continuing to work with uh, Good Sam, all of our outreach partners um, on where those funding allocations are going to go and how they're going to be best used with the city, with law enforcement, and when we do uh, mental health response models. With human trafficking, uh, and I apologize, I hope I'm not going too fast. If, if I am, please let me know. Um, so with, with human trafficking, we plan to host, we've, we've already got it on the books, uh, training between April 4th and April 8th to talk about human trafficking, to talk about the dark web. So we are bringing in uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Powell and another expert um, from the West Coast to, to bring this information to us. We're gonna open this up to, of course, our department the state's attorney's office and other state's attorney offices throughout the state, as well as law enforcement agencies across the state. There is uh, uh, funding available that we're only going to have to cover the cost of logistics and flying these folks in, but the actual cost to, to host the actual training is going to be paid for via other means, not by the city. When we talk about data transparency, this is with our current system with, with Valcor, it's it's hard to pull information from the system and to decipher it. It's not like new technology out nowadays that you, you set a system up and then, then boom, it pops out in more accurate ways. Um, and we don't have that particular skill set in the department and, and several of us who can do that. Uh, our, our time again is being divided in so many different different areas because of uh, the staffing situation. So we're working to try to use interns. So far last year, we had our first set of two interns from Norwich University. Now we have two more. So this is going on a quarterly basis. And we're having to retrain the interns to look at the data, to pull it from Valcor, to decipher it uh, for public con uh, consumption. But of course, there, there are obstacles again because of um, some capabilities with the system, as well as having to retrain the interns on a constant uh, basis. I, I prefer to incorporate new technology um, for this administrative lift. And uh, that part of that administrative lift or this, this new technology was a recommendation set out by the Televate uh, study that uh, was commissioned by the uh, CVPSA. So there's more to come on that. For body worn cameras, that it was uh, it was approved and placed on the budget. We're waiting for a decision on uh, a town meeting day, um, and that money was thirty five thousand dollars. That was allotted for body worn cameras. Uh, pending approval, we will work with vendors to make sure that they have the capability and functions that we're looking for, and then we'll go ahead and go through the uh, the purchasing process and move forward for the body worn camera program. The policy is already written and it's pretty much a state mandated policy that we have to work with that's been set up, set down by the uh, um, the criminal justice center at the academy. I'm sorry, the criminal justice council. So in, in this slide here, there was, uh, uh, this was the, the previous slide that I had given. Um, there was a typo here at the front because I didn't give you the recurring costs. So, the actual operational spending is updated. Uh, $35,000 uh, was allotted for body-worn cameras um, and within the operational budget, and that there was uh, $130,000 for mental health and street outreach purposes. And looking over to the side and updating the numbers there, we thought it was gonna be a $2,000 one-time cost um, to, to provide the training for um, human trafficking. That's actually three. And then right below it, as we're looking at crowd control training or crowd management training from two, that's actually going to be $3,000. Uh, to the right column, that's uh, giving updates, officer misconduct and internal affairs, that new policy was written. That policy was based on um, 
uh, a model policy given to us by the Vermont uh, League of Cities and Towns, as well as best practice benchmark models from ICP, PERF, and other agencies, uh, and, and just and then combining it with what the uh, the state law is. So that policy is written. We also do have IA tracking or internal affairs tracking uh, with through benchmark that should be coming online. Actually, that is online now. And then as we're talking about, again, uh, there, there is some discussion that may be required or just some approval from the city council regarding how we're doing the reporting for uh, internal affairs investigations or complaints to the department. And looking at the street outreach capacity, it's actually gonna be clear if I just say there's $65,000 that was allotted for mental health and another 65,000 for that total for, um, for street outreach, which is where that 130K is. And then looking at the that final column where it says city does not support, um, as we're uh, as we're talking about um, uh, as it comes specifically to officer recruitment, uh, what those minimum standards are, uh, MPD has brought in a very robust hiring process that's in place, and and that does include emotional uh, intelligence based uh, vetting, and that comes from a uh, a program called Critical Hire in which folks who we're looking to bring on as we offer them a, a conditional offer of employment, one of the things in addition to an MMPI, uh, in addition to the, um, uh, the polygraph test, we ask them to take the critical hire test, which, which gives us a very good view of what their emotional intelligence level is, work ethic, and things to those points. So uh, in moving forward, as we, as we look for the future, um, to provide updates to the council. Uh, this is where we're standing at. Um, that again, again we, we agree with data transparency, but this requires an ongoing discussion because of lack of, of personnel and bandwidth and, and definitely lack of money that will help us to get to this point that um, this information is at the fingertips uh, real time to the council, to the public, and to the department as well as we do our, our CompStat reporting internally. Um, officer misconduct and internal affairs, that's good. again, it's looking at the um, uh, any, any oversight that will come from the city council and the city manager and the assistant city manager. Uh, we require some context from the city council at a later date, uh, talking about the public drinking ordinance and then uh, more discussions based on uh, the policy for fair and impartial policing, um, looking at what those minimal standards are for, uh, for law enforcement as we recruit, and, and then talking about uh, prostitution, the legal framework. And with that, uh, those are, that is my presentation and I stand ready for any questions or any comments or any, 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 uh, uh, any discussion with uh, Alyssa. Great, thank you. Um, yes, Alyssa, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for the presentation and for uh, Chief P and for the city council for bringing this back and the city for preparing for this. This is great. It's so nice to actually do work and then have it be followed up on instead of just like go into the abyss and no one ever talks about it again. So, so appreciate um, all of you um, in your work moving, moving this forward. And um, also, I do want to recognize um, the partnership Chief P and MPD had with us throughout this process. They were they were really um, helpful um, putting forward all this information. Obviously, are taking this very seriously. Um, I think there's some really great progress that has been made here. Um, the scenario based training, body worn cameras, some of the youth and adolescent behavior training, having to create that. Um, the intoxication and de-escalation training with partners, you know, a lot of good things to point to, um, you know, and one other positive thing that's really struck me throughout this presentation, and did we lose Chief Pete here? Or is he still here? Oh, no, there you are. Okay, great. My screen, these little faces are so small. My laptop is too small. Glad you're still here. Okay is that um, I've appreciated it the most, even that you are making such an effort to draw from community resources clearly, instead of reinventing the wheel, like you're trying to pull the community closer and um, uh, instead of going it alone. So um, with that, I, have, I do have a couple of questions on some of the things that you um, put forward and I'll do this like a couple smaller, four or five smaller questions first. And then there are a couple of bigger questions, which may, we may or may not want to get into tonight, but um, I'll pose those last. 
So on the community engagement process, uh, you know, we had wrestled with whether or not um, after an officer involved shooting or after a major traumatic uh, community event, we had wrestled with whether MPD should lead that protocol process or whether the city itself should create the protocol. And so um, I guess I'm just interested in what your thoughts are after, you know, thinking a little bit more about that or uh, and in terms of, there were a couple members of the former police review committee that were interested in that conversation. And I think we need to figure out like if you'll drive it or the city will drive it and then whatever next step is there. So I can definitely also leave that to, uh, to Cameron and Bill who are also on as well. But our, our initial thought um, was that to, to provide as much information as we can, minimum information, uh, a maximum information, minimal delay uh, out to the public, and then be, be there to answer any questions as we look at, you know, whether it's a virtual or in-person town hall to those, to those, uh, to any type of events, but maybe not us facilitating them because there's, there's often, you know, the human response is always going to be defensiveness and 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 if and if and if it's our information our responsibility to get that information out we want to make sure that we're we're there in a capacity that we're serving and providing that information rather than being the primary uh people who are facilitating that discussion so my my off the cuff thought on this one is to have somebody from outside uh, facilitate how this goes and then having us there to provide that information and to answer the questions from our community so um, given that, it might make sense for the city to think about if the city wants to take on the next step here. I know Cameron had taken, um, was considering whether or not there should be some relationship with like a trauma-informed facilitator. So that part of the process would be if there was a major event, there was someone that was trained with the community dynamics of trauma and creating a space for healing. The police would be one constituency of really important one there, but wouldn't be the primary one. So I just I just offer that to the city to keep thinking about. Maybe we should come back to that at some other point, but um, we stand at the ready to, or at least um, a couple folks um, had from the former police review committee stand ready to continue to engage in that conversation. And if I could bring up something real quickly before boss jumps in is uh, Carol had also offered to be part of that discussion to, part, to, to lead those facilitations um, from the community justice center. Yeah, that's basically what I was going to say, too. Um, so thank you for flagging that, Alyssa. We had given this some thought and realized the seriousness of it. Um, in all honesty, this report came in in the fall and we moved right into budget. So we, we went straight to kind of focus on those things with budget impact. Um, but knowing this was was coming back, we, we've talked again and recognized the importance. So um, we have Carol from CJC has offered to be involved in this whether they would be the lead agency to actually conduct this or just help us think it through. But we, we are, will be getting back with some ideas and I think having the, the, the either president or former PRC involved to, to give, give us feedback on that would be really helpful. Great, thank you. Um, on the youth and adolescent behavior training, I think that that, that training sounds um, ro you know, positive, robust and tailored. Uh, and it, did you say, Chief Pete, that you would be recording it so people could see it on like an ongoing basis, like you could do it annually or something or, or have it be updated to continue to use it? For, for cost saving purposes and because of staffing issues and, and the, the, uh, the different shifts that folks come into work, that was our initial thought was to get as many people as we could in the room and then record it. But uh, Prevent Child Abuse Vermont is, is that's, that's a no go for them. So we're okay. going to, they're recommending that we do it in person and reach every member of the staff. Well, that's great. And um, th that might make pose uh, some challenges as you look to do it in the future. Uh, you know, um, as well, but uh, I think it's great that they're doing it and um, too bad you can't record that. Uh, in terms of the um, training uh, around crowd management, uh, do you have a sense if uh, the kind of the Madison model principles that we had talked about were, were principles where we want to help people use our space and facilitate that use in the most positive experience possible, you have mentioned in the past that MPD already deploys a lot of those 
um, practices. Do you know if this training in Florida will be reinforcing that type of approach? Because there's a lot of different crowd control um, strategies, as I'm sure you know very well, like, uh, and there's a real spectrum of approach there. Yeah, so so that's where that's where I wanted to highlight the difference between crowd control and management. So the focus here is actually is is based in Madison model. It's it's how to prepare and plan to avoid situations from evolving to the point that we cannot contain them. There, to, we have to get to the point that we don't have a, a, a cooperation between those who are demonstrating exercising their rights uh, to one that's gonna be more adversarial and confrontational. So, so the focus is definitely based on that mass and model of life and safety, property second, um, and, but, but how do we get to the point that we don't even have to have that discussion? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, cool. that's great, thank you. Um, in terms of the increased mental and professional uh, mental health uh, professional funding. I know that the police review committee had it requested 1.5 additional FTEs uh, allocated to that uh, would be a, combina a combination of social work plus peer outreach support. Uh, we see that, you know, there's 0.5 that was put in the budget of FTE. So one FTE total at this point, and half that will be split with social worker um, response and half appears to be split with the follow-up, which is critical. And we totally support that in, in a lot of our conversations. Um, has the peer outreach angle been lost? No, it, it hasn't. That's part of it. As we're looking at like the crisis intervention team model, um, actually uh, Dan is part of that, the CIT steering committee and he's advocating. And, and, and so so the steering committee is actually leaning on him to develop the peer support model. What we found is that there is actually no across the board peer support model anywhere in the state of Vermont. So this is something that's gonna to have to be built from scratch where we'd be more than happy to lead the way in doing that and showing uh, and, and being that baseline for the state to work upon. So, um, but that's what we found. So even if even if that, that funding were to go to peer support model, uh, you have to get volunteers, you have to get training and you have to make sure that training certified. How is it vetted? How do you know that that's the appropriate training? And then there are other questions as what we look at as far as peer support. Are we talking turning point for like say uh, alcohol and substance abuse or are we talking things like uh, domestic violence peer support or uh, schizophrenia or skis order, personality disorder uh, peer supports? So what does that look like? Which buckets and how that works? But that's not lost. That's something we're trying to build up extraordinarily quickly. Okay. Um, and I have three more, uh, three more questions. So thank you so much for all this time. Um, you know, hopefully we'll only be doing this once every six months or something. Uh, so uh, the on the street outreach worker, uh, you know, that have been through Good Samaritan, um, I'm wondering it, you know, we have now allocated halftime FTE that was existing and a halftime FTE that is new in the city budget, as I understand it. Do you know if that position has been filled and uh, is that position working um, with, you know, with folks here. Yeah. I, I can jump in on that, Alyssa. Actually, there's the halftime position for social worker that had already been filled, the one that we were sharing with Barry. We also have Don, who has been the peer outreach worker that is funded by um, Good Samaritan and continues to be funded and is in the budget for next year. And then an additional half based on your recommendation that the chief just described. So, that's total of 1.5 and so we're still 1.0 short of the additional recommendation that you had, which hopefully we'll get next year. Um, thank you. I was trying to say the same thing. So I'm glad you clarified. Um, my question is, has the new resource, like has the new FTE, the new Dawn, the, the new halftime Dawn been filled yet? No, okay. Um, but there's every intention to do it and the resources are there. It's more just we need to do it for the half time additional street outreach worker that is focused not on the mental health side, but on the um, street engagement work around like on the, with the unhoused community. Yes, and that's based off approval from the uh, for the uh, the city budget. So once that budget goes through and the new fiscal year starts, that's when we can look at the financial. Um, uh, that's when we can look at giving that money to Good Sam to uh, to look for that position. 
Okay. Um, so the, the last two questions that I have are one, um, I think like a big issue here that that is one that both the police review committee and MPD both are interested in addressing, but uh, you know, the update today doesn't really address it is the data transparency issue. Um, you know, that was one of the biggest things that we heard in engaging with the public that they want to be able to just go on the website and click and see like how many, you know, arrests have been made, what type of arrest, you know, what, you know, the traffic data and have all of that readily accessible. And, you know, we had to compile a lot of that data ourselves through the process. I mean, MPD gave us like the raw data and then we had to like create spreadsheets and tables and stuff. And so um, it sounds like you have interns doing that same process now, but that really seems unsustainable to just have interns do that constantly for all of time, you know? So, um, and you just won't get, the public will not get that up, you know, that current data. So. Um, you flagged it as a continuing issue, Chief Pete, and I guess I'm just wondering, like, the price tag is big to get one of these systems that give you, like, a real-time dashboard for police stats. Um, so I, I'm wondering, like, have you found any grants or, like, what is would a, would a one-time investment of money um, be a lot, but then an ongoing cost be a lot less? Have you Have you looked into this? And uh, are there any one-time funds that maybe we could use right now around COVID monies around any of this? Like, I don't know, but this seems like a need that we've both identified and it's not being filled. Oh, no, it's the only thing that's keeping me for it is, is the money. So I'm estimating it would, to get a truly robust system that has the capability to do an API backdoor to pull from the system so that we're not doing it on a daily basis. Um, so we have to overcome the website issues that we have with our current or with, with our current system, which is the city is, is working diligently on. And then we also have to look at what the system's going to look like. The estimates, uh, the estimation for something like that is probably going to be anywhere between Three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars to get this type of a system because it's also piggybacking on to the Televate study that talks about a true computer-aided dispatch system. So if we get a true computer-aided dispatch system, we can add things like online reporting information that it will pull out those types of calls. It would even do something like a crime map, if you will, that you can put in an address and then you can see. Uh, all throughout the map, what types of calls for service happen within any given date range. So it's an extraordinarily robust system. Uh, the one-time cost, again, is between three to 400, and then the annual cost, you're looking at anywhere between three to $5,000 a year uh, to operational funding, and that's part of that new technology thing. And yes, grants, I am, I, I, I've been, I'm looking for money every possibly, every, every possible way I can. And that's not by the wayside of me. That was that was on my to-do list as, first, as, as soon as I got here. Yeah, yeah. Well, this might be one of those topics that the city or the city council want to come back to like every few months to just go like, hey, are there any resources for this yet? Because it, there's, there's always going to be a need for the community to see w this information. Like that's never going to go away. Eventually we'll want to solve this problem. I know it's a big price tag, but we shouldn't forget about it. Um, okay, so there's not really nothing we can do about that here. I assume no one's going to pull three hundred thousand dollars out of a hat. So, uh, and did you have three hundred thousand? Was that a handout? No, oh, that was me being like, I wish. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, okay, well, the last thing for me and Justin Dreschler is here from the Police Review Committee too, and so I just want to give him an opportunity if he had anything further, but um, is on the internal affairs process that you um, put forward. I think it there, I think it is much improved from um, the, the last process. Uh, and um, I think some of the particularly positive things in this new process are like the quick, the goal of having it be a 30 day investigation time, for example, that's a real, I think a real process. And that also you will be using, um, you know, third party repository for the information. And there's a check at the city level and that the information around reports also go to the city council. Um, I'm wondering, I think there's a, there's a couple of principles that may have been lost in, in, you know, in translation, or maybe you consider them and, and discount them, but, you know, the city council having the opportunity, if I understand this right, to review your internal affairs reports, 
the council, no disrespect, may not have the um, exper expertise or profile to maximize um, that review process. So, you know, they might not have an HR background. They might not have police experience. They might not have um, legal experience. Some of the things that we flagged uh, in the process, uh, if, if folks remember the internal affairs process, one of the aspects of that process that we were hoping to see was that there'd be like an annual audit function of a third party committee that had expertise that would be you know, relevant to the review. And so um, I just wonder if we're missing that step here, uh, if we're missing the uh, an audit function and if we're missing an audit function by people who have that um, that background, that would that would really be valuable here. Do you have thoughts on that? Yes, so the um, so what we've baked into the policy and what you know that is the recommended policy. Um, so so throughout, the most important stage is to make sure that we do have that 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 right is while we have to notify the HR manager, um, while we have to notify the assistant city manager, the city manager, while I, while I'm involved in it um, for the investigative and the law background, and then we also um, do consultation with the state's attorney's office or the attorney general's office as as necessary. The other reporting requirement that backs up on that is that we have to report this to the um, based under Act 56. I could. Personally, I could lose my certification if I don't adhere to that. The, the chief of police loses their, his certification or her certification if they don't adhere to Act 56. And Act 56 is, in essence, everything that you're saying that that entire process is followed and it's and it's adhered to. So that initial checklist that's in that um, in that policy um, that has there's an intake form, there's an ending form. All of that has to be sent to the uh, to the Criminal Justice Council. That's composed of, uh, I, I think they're all the way up to what 22 people now, um, and the majority of them are civilian-based board. So they do the review of of the complaint that came in, whether the department acted appropriately, whether they investigated it thoroughly, and then whether the um, uh, and and whether uh, and looking at the disposition. So. As we're looking at things like civil and criminal violations, there are outweighs or there are outlets for that. Um, but the other outlet is you can lose certification. So even if, even if for some reason the city said uh, we're going to hold on to this person for X, Y, Z, the criminal justice council can say, okay, that's great, but we're pulling that person's certification so they can't be a law enforcement officer anywhere in the state of Vermont. So there are so many checks and balances, but that primary one comes, it goes right through the state through the, the CJC. Uh, and they would give you feedback or come back to you with trends, you believe? They would come back and say like, hey, we just reviewed this complaint and we're concerned about X, Y, or Z. So for, for, that, uh, for that trend aspect, um, not necessarily. Um, I, I, there's not necessarily a mechanism there, but there, there is knowing the folks who are, who are there, they would bring that up. But uh, the significance also is to annually in that policy, we have to provide an annual report to the city council and that city council and, and the city council, and it talks about the trends. These are the majority of the complaints that we're seeing that are coming in. Here's what the administrative inquiry complaints were or the in administrative inquiries we've conducted as well as the internal affairs uh, that we've conducted so that the council will be able to look at that and see well, we have concerns. All of, the, all of the IAs that you've done, they've centered around conduct type of issues. What are you doing to fix it? But even before we even get to that point, the, uh, the program that we have, Benchmark Analytics, takes into effect uh, everything like that. It's an early warning system as well as a, as a cataloging system, uh, even down to the point that staff members are putting in their weight and, and they're required to update what their weight is. And so they've got it down to the science that's gonna say like, look at me, I've, I've gained like 20 pounds already. So if I'm putting in there, um, hey, I was 189 um, two months ago and I've got three complaints leveled against me. And then the last time I did my weight check, I came in at 200, um, then, then you, there's a boom, there's a red flag you need to talk to this person, you need to reach out to Sonny Provoto or, or see what types of different things are going on. So there are so many systems that are baked into that. Does the public, and this is my last question, and Justin doesn't have any questions, he texted me. And so I don't know if um, Councillor McCullough or Hurl have any um, 
you know, other other pieces who were really important members of the committee as well. But my final question is the report that goes to the city council, will that information be public? Yes, everything that we, we plan on putting that out in annual reports and updating the websites every time we, we, uh, we pull a report like that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Jack, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief, for the report and, uh, and Alyssa for, uh, for the great uh, discussion. Um, I, I know a couple of the things that we've talked about have to do with, uh, with police department policies. And I know just in the last couple of days, we've gotten um, a couple of new policies from the, from the department, including the internal affairs and uh, citizen complaint policy and the uh, police review commission uh, report talks about uh, taking another look at the uh, uh, bias free policing uh, policy and so i'm just wondering and uh, i'm not sure who has the answer to this of what the uh, relationship is between the uh, policies adopted by the uh, by the police department and the authority of the uh, council to uh, to review those policies, because um, you know, for instance, thinking about the bias free policing policy, I know the uh, city staff has said they're satisfied with the uh, policy the way it's written, and they don't support a change. Um, the commission said, well, you know, we think there are some uh, issues where it, it could be made more protective. And so how do we, how do we get at that to, uh, to resolve uh, questions that, uh, that of this nature? Well, I mean, you could, that is certainly an issue you could put on a council agenda if you wanted to discuss it. Um, you know, I mean, there are some issues here that I think are appropriate for council follow up, including the ones that we've kind of, you know, left there at the end. Um, but that is one. In fact, the current uh, policy we have was actually, I think, either adopted or run past the council um, before it was enacted. And I think, you know, not, not to preempt that conversation, some of the point, you know, when we say we think it's fine, the way it is, it's because it matches exactly the state law and the federal law on that issue. And um, we'd be happy to talk about that further if necessary. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Lots of good um, questions. Um, Lauren, did I see you had a hand? Yeah, go yes, ahead. Yes, I did. Great. And I think, Stephen, you might be unmuted. It's giving me a lot of feedback. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Chief Pete, uh, for all the updates. It's really great to see, as Alyssa said, the progress and the diligence. And I know you all have been understaffed, so taking on a lot of updates and like continuing the really um, speedy forward progress on all this, particularly in those conditions, really grateful to see and the spirit of so many of the recommendations moving forward. Um, and so just appreciate that. I'm really excited for, you know, keeping informed on things like the um, recommendation that comes back from the team on the increased staffing for um, social work and or peer support and all of that. Um, I appreciate the department. I know a few of us have been able to check out the new virtual reality um, headset and training tool, and it really reinforced uh, what a challenging job you have. <laughs> and um, grateful that you all are doing it. Um, and it's great to see the department just continuing to seek out grants and opportunities to be kind of as cutting edge and, and be a resource for our community and also making that available and new training opportunities and stuff uh, for the region and the state. So that's, that's all great to see. Um, one just very minor thing, but I noticed on the side that um, I think the training that you all are thinking about um, hosted on human trafficking, um, like the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. I'm just flagging like two, they 
have participated in a number of community conversations and are considered, I think, a pretty controversial group. Their background is like, if you Google them, it's like they've fought against, it's like anti-pornography, anti-comprehensive sex education. They've trying to ban certain types of literature and art. Um, so if the department is getting training from them, I would at a minimum encourage hearing from other organizations that might have a very different perspective. Um, so just would want to round out whatever information you're getting because I think they're viewed as a like pretty certain perspective that they would bring. Um, so I wanted to note that. Um, but, you know, overall, again, I think just, you know, Alyssa had flagged also, um, but just like the, the data and transparency is one of our key things. So definitely eager to continue the conversation of how we can build that out, both for the internal affairs process um, that does look like some great improvement and how do we um, have transparency and even being able to measure is that approach working and working well for the community um, as that rolls out. Um, and, and, you know, and I am eager to take up as we get into um, the coming months, um, the, the full suite of, you know, there's only a handful left, I think that the PRC had put forward, um, but definitely want to at least bring all of them up to council um, because the, uh, the committee spent so much time thinking through and uh, developing those recommendations. So I want to give them all their kind of due consideration by council, but again, thanks. And, and thanks the team. Uh, thank you the, to uh, the department. Please share our gratitude for all the hard work going into it. And, uh, thanks, Alyssa and the uh, Police Review Committee team um, also who had put so much work into all these thoughtful recommendations. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I want to certainly thank, if you, um, Alyssa, could pass on our, our gratitude to the, the Police Review Committee again to us, that would be great. And also um, thank you, Chief, uh, for your like thoughtful uh, you know responses to each of these. I mean, I think this is... Um, and, you know, it's an it's an ongoing complex conversation, and uh, it's it's um, I appreciate everybody's uh, positivity and engagement in in all of this. Um, other, I, I have some thoughts about moving forward, but um, I want to hear if there's other comments from folks. I want to make sure that everybody has a, the opportunity um, to jump in. Um, just to check, Jennifer, did I was that a hand or no? Okay, uh, all right, uh, Connor, go ahead. I, I just wanted to piggyback on that, Mayor. I think this had potential to be like an adversarial process, but a lot of credit to the department that, you know, these are some substantive issues thrown your way, but you, but you take them very seriously as we're shown today. And on the other side, you know, Alyssa, you know, a lot of these committees will just write a report and say, hey, job well done. Um, obviously that's not where you're coming from and you're staying on top of this. Um, so I, I think we have a lot of progress to make, but I, I, I just want to, uh, you know, commend the, uh, the process so far, I, I, I think it's been re really enlightening, and uh, I, I love the way everybody's working together here. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts um, from council or the public before we discuss um, how to move forward? Uh, Steve Whitaker. Okay, Steve, go ahead. So I want to uh, touch on a couple of points I heard. Uh, I think that we should not lose sight of the potential need for a police oversight commission. I can see lots of bobbing and weaving and dancing to try to prevent that from happening. But it's important to note that this police review committee did not, it was, it was very hemmed in to forward looking uh, positive uh, change suggestions. It was not looking at the history of abuses and malfeasance, which has to be aired and documented if you're gonna, you have to acknowledge the failures before you can move forward. You can't just dance your way around them. So uh, the police contract, for instance, uh, Frazier arranged that to just be moved on the, on the consent agenda. That's where all the, you know, uh, immunity and, uh, disciplinary actions are moved. That was not reviewed really by council. It wasn't open to public comment. It was pushed on the consent agenda. That's freaking outrageous. You know, uh, Act 56 is not local. We have local problems that have gone on for 30 years in my experience, and we need to deal with them locally. You can't just wrap it all in a bow and call it, you know, a statewide oversight. Uh, 
let's see, no need to. Oh, currently we have no need to, or no process. We've got a, a ghost committee formed by the contract with the police and Cap Capital Fire that is supposedly several members of Capital Fire, the city manager, the fire chief, the you know, the police chief. But this committee has never warned a meeting, has never met, has never created any minutes. And yet we've had errors that resulted in the shooting of Mark Johnson. We've had errors and resulted in 30 minute delays for ambulances. These are not reviewed or audited or documented or explained in any way. They're all swept under the rug. And that this is not covered in the police review committee's report. I hope they're still listening. I do applaud Alyssa's stick to itiveness. Um, I have that uh, disease too, as you all know. Uh, the council should adopt policies. The, po the police department are hired guns, literally, and they need to be held to account, and the council and the public should review and approve the, the policies, not the police department itself. Um, regarding the outreach worker, half-time, Dawn tells me she's only paid for 12 hours a week. So you're talking she's half-time, and now we're adding another half-time? So something's not adding up there. And this is, again, a problem with handing the money to nonprofits who are sitting there on the homelessness task force voting uh, appropriations to themselves and no accountability because there's no public records law transparency. Um, there was another person hit by uh, a local hit by walking with a walker in the in hit and knocked down by an automobile. And it doesn't make the police report, you know, that runs in the Times Argus, you know. Similarly, the homeless person that was hit two years ago uh, on his way to the shelter, uh, Green Mountain Transit left the scene, was not charged. Uh, I mean, it seems like we've got this underclass of people. Yeah, just hit them, hit, hit them, knock them out of the way, and then the police will sweep it under the rug for you. That is just freaking outrageous. I've been denied access to the records of who hit Winnie in the crosswalk and why and whether they were charged. And and it's just, you know, this is the stuff the city council should be doing if you were earning your 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 position. So we don't need to slow walk this accountability on trends. We need accountability now. We need to get rid of the bad apples. We've got internal affairs is really a joke. I've reported to the new chief on his first day on the job, he encountered a police officer who used to be the school resource officer who blatantly lied on an affidavit to the court. And that's not been raised as internal affairs. Nobody's investigated that. You know, that same officer lied on another occasion about what state law is about, you know, somebody in a parking lot. And the, the, Report from Valcors from the state, the CAD system says that there's video of the incident, but the video went missing. You know, do you smell corruption here? I mean, this is just, it's just outrageous that y'all can just turn a blind eye to all this. I mean, I'm going to, you know, later on in the meeting, talk about having, you, you have an obligation. If you're not going to do the due diligence yourself, you need to have an obligation to hire an attorney to validate who's telling the truth. And you will find that I've been telling you the truth for years and you've been sweeping it under the rug. So we've got problems with the CAD system having a report in it that this guy is suicidal, wants to jump off the bridge, is off his meds, and he's, and, and he's going to hurt himself. And instead, instead of the police dispatch warning the officer, they did warn him that it's Mark Johnson. They didn't say, here's what happened two weeks ago. They said nothing and the guy put two bullets and killed him okay this this is not been resolved the mayor you mayor you swept this under the rug you offered a public hearing you put it number seven on the next meeting agenda and notified no one that it was going to happen so this is on you so anyway that's enough for tonight but you understand where i'm coming from this is a bigger problem than you're pretending this is all not you know happy go forward this is like let's account for what's already happened Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so just thinking about how do we move forward? Um, 
from uh, this conversation. Um, so there are a number of items that uh, we, uh, the council, I think probably needs to, um, to, uh, to address moving forward. And, um, and Lauren, I know you had said like, we should be talking about all of them um, at some point. I, I don't know if you have ones that you think are, um, uh, you know, should we should take up sooner rather than later? Um, or if uh, uh, Alyssa, you all have opinions about which ones we should be taking up sooner rather than later. Um, I think my only um, thought about moving forward is that I think any one of the remaining topics could take up uh, substantial time. And so I would recommend that we only uh, generally do them sort of, you know, we, we shouldn't be planning to do them more than um, one at a time. Um, and some of these may even take up multiple meetings as we sort of have the discussion and hear from people and, and whatnot. Um, so, uh, you know, not knowing how those conversations exactly will go. Uh, so, um, uh, Lauren or, or Jack, I mean, I know you're on that committee as well. Um, I'm just re referencing Lauren since she was, you know, saying, yeah, we should be putting them all on. Or, or Jack, I know you'd, you'd mentioned like, oh, we should be talking about um, the fair and impartial policing uh, piece of this. But um, so anyway, I'm curious for your thoughts uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, uh, Lauren, uh, go ahead. And then and Jack, if you want to add anything on to that, um, I'll go to you next. Yeah, thanks. I mean, my, my, preferred approach would be to um, try to follow up because uh, the way we did it on the police review committee was people were kind of spearheading the different um, policy recommendations. So I would want to just check in with the folks that were the leads on those sections on kind of availability to participate and be kind of available as a resource to counsel to participate and, you know, share the, the research and thinking that had gone into it from the PRC. So, um, you know, if we want to, you know, maybe I could plan to come back to the next meeting with a proposal based on the input on people's availability and some assessment. And I can maybe work with Jack and Alyssa on this as well. <laughs> um, but looking at, you know, because I, I think some could take more or less time and we're farther or closer from maybe the um, police department's preferences, for example. <laughs> so um, how does that approach sound? I mean, just speaking for myself here, that I think makes a lot of sense, especially if there are point people um, that might <laughs> want to participate. Um, so that uh, other thoughts on that recommendation. I, I agree with what, what Lauren just said. I think, uh, you know, it, it's like we do with a lot of other things. We, uh, count members of council and staff talk to uh, people who, who want to bring issues before us and, and line up a process and a, and a schedule for that to happen. And I, and I think it makes sense. And I also agree with you and that it probably makes sense to stage it over a period of time because we have other things that we also have to be dealing with, but. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Um, other uh, thoughts any, or any disagreement? Any, any thoughts that we should take on a different approach? Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm not seeing any um, disagreement there. So um, uh, Lauren or Lauren and Jack, if you um, come up with a sort of a tentative um, outline of how you think it would make sense for us to take up those topics, um, certainly open to those suggestions. So, um, so I assume we'll, we'll have, we'll, we'll bring this back up as a topic um, next time. You know, just in thinking about, I, I guess it, it makes sense to, um, to bring back that calendar, so to speak, uh, to the council. Um, and if there are items that people are really passionate about, you know, moving up or, you know, putting off indefinitely or whatever it is, um, that uh, that would be an opportunity for folks to to express um, those things. Does that? Yeah, I'd, be, I'd be happy to work with the two council members on drafting something up and either getting the schedule out of an upcoming meeting or putting it in the weekly on our schedule. Yeah. That'd be great, especially, you know, coordinating with things that we already know are on the schedule. Um, yeah, that would be really helpful. 
<laughs> so no, we're not trying to do like the zoning and also, <laughs> you know, a uh, conversation about prostitution or something, you know, that, that would be, that would be a lot. Um, so, okay. Um, any other thoughts on this team? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, um, uh, Chief, and, and thank you, Alyssa, uh, and um, yeah, for all for all of your collective work on this, and uh, to be continued. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll, re we'll keep revisiting it. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, thank you. Have a good night. Um, all right, so we are uh, ready to move on to the city manager's um, uh, review and contract. Uh, Jack, oh, it's 8.30. Yes, Jack, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say it's 8.30 on the dot, time <laughs> for our break. It is, it's true. Okay, so um, I think we should take a break. Um, so we, we will be back at 8.40. And uh, I don't know, oh, yes, Bill, go ahead. I could offer a suggestion, I think. Okay. I know there's at least one person, there may be two that want to comment on this topic. Okay. Um, it might be wise to take the comments. We're going to go into executive session anyway and take the break. Then I presume we're going to go into executive session, yeah. but then not make someone hang around while we take a break just to offer comments. That's that seems fair. That's good. That's a good call. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah. So, regarding uh, city managers' uh, review and contract. If um, if there are folks that have comments about that, now would be an okay time. Um, you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself or um, turn your video on, let us know. Well, I think it's unfair when everybody's expecting a break to expect the uh, somebody to rush with their comments on the topic. This is very complex. This is a multi-year problem, you know? Well, so if you'd I'd rather speak after the break. So you'd prefer to speak after the break. Anyone prefer to speak um, before the break? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, that's fine. All right, uh, so let's take a break. It's 8.31, we'll be back 8, oh, 8.32, we'll be back 8.42, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, sound all right, everybody? But we are, we are, I know, right? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, all right, so uh, council's all back, which is great. Uh, all right, so um, we're gonna come back from our break here. And uh, so in terms of comments on the uh, city manager review and contract, uh, Steve, I know you wanna say something, then we'll discuss uh, going to into executive session. All right, go ahead, Steve. Thank you for accommodating that request to do it afterwards. Um, am I the only person commenting before you go into executive session? Go ahead and make your comments, Steve. Okay, so I don't know. Okay, um, I probably got five minutes here, but I've, it's well researched and it's thoroughly, you, a lot of it you've heard before, but it's organized around this issue. So in considering whether or not to renew the city manager's contract, I believe it's important to review the historical record. The manager has been employed for 26, 28, nearly 30 years, and it's not been all roses and chocolate cake. The position is now costing us three, 138,000 annual plus medical plus dental plus retirement plus travel subscriptions phone fully loaded in 2004 an overpayment to a contractor in the amount of 462,000 occurred on this city manager's watch wasn't discovered for a couple of years and then the funds weren't ever fully recovered but what's worse is that the city manager in concert with the council at the time kept this loss a secret from the public for years and hiding it behind some lame rationale of potentially being better able to recover more of it. That didn't happen. But from the transparency point of view, that incident alone was grounds to get rid of the city manager at that time and why he's unemployable elsewhere. We're not a home for city mismanagers. We simply can't afford it any longer. We, let's take some other examples. The multimodal transit center. The city paid three or four times too much for the car lot in its toxicity. And yet it's still not finished. There's still ADA doors that are not operable. 
motors with wires hanging out, locked phone charging. The project's been abandoned, and yet there's, it's still not done. We have storm drains along the path that are still blocked years after the building opened. The building could have and should have been designed with showers and lockers to enable the folks that need it, and it wasn't, and there's no good reason for having not. Nor can the large buses turn around. So that's just another example of a bungled project. The connected paths, for years, for decades, we've had a planning priority for walkability about our town, and the connections of the paths are not to be interrupted. In fact, they're supposed to be enhanced and improved. Instead, we ended up with a new multi-million dollar bridge with dangerous gaps in each end and poorly maintained bike path and no connection through to the Haney lot which the city leases and through that lot to the bike path, which is a common thoroughfare for walkers, including the elderly pushing and pulling grocery carts now up mud and ice slopes through the Capitol Plaza lot. At one point in the design, through public records, I found out the planning showed there was a circular ramp to be attached to the rounded retaining wall to connect those three levels for handicapped accessibility, and yet it was removed, and apparently there are no public records indicating who removed it and why with what rationale or cost justification. This is not the only example of public records disappearing. Recent requests for public records regarding the body camera proposal, which included tasers, which included evaluations. Those emails showing that taser and body cameras were loaned to the city, that agreement has not been produced, is a violation of public records law, which are rampant under this city manager. Appeals to the head of the agency under law routinely go unanswered or are incomplete. The partial responses are not in compliance with the law, which requires either certifying that the records don't exist or are exempt or production of the records. I brought this to your attention way too many times and you've swept it under the rug. This city manager repeatedly flies in the face of that important transparency law. And now it's worse. He's corrupting our new police chief with the same behaviors. He's in effect teaching Brian that it's okay way to do business because that's the way Bill does it. The million dollars you're still trying to raise from the bond to pay off the million dollar debt for the parking garage, it still hasn't been fully taken accountability. The press is still lied to over that issue and y'all refuse to hire an attorney to get to who's telling the truth. That's not rocket science. On top of that, the city manager was warned that the downtown core master plan should not proceed until the issue of whether the garage is gonna be built. That cost, that plan cost us more than $200,000 and yet it was based on the assumption that the garage would be there. I warned the council, I warned the manager that it either should be put on hold or should be designed for both scenarios. You, you proceeded with the assumed garage scenario and now we have a wasted and useless quarter million dollar core master plan that will have to be redone and yet it isn't even in the budget this year. The transit center restrooms. The city manager refuses to enforce the contract with Green Mountain Transit requiring them to be kept open during the full business hours. Instead, he prefers to cater to the transit to the tenant at only a dollar a year rather than take care of the folks who have no other place to use the bathroom. The district heat, we invested so much in the district heat system and now we're running an $800,000 deficit. We had all the streets opened up and somebody failed, I'll put it on the city manager, failed to arrange to install empty conduits under the street to accommodate fiber optics to get to every building. But to have the missed opportunity to put fiber optics under the streets and similarly to cut the conduits when fair, when consolidated just cut many streets is a fireable offense in my informed opinion. Truck access, we were tearing down the M&M Redemption Center. Assurances were made to the parking for drawing board would be restored that year as would truck access to the rear. They still have not and now years later. The truck access through M&M to the Abishan's rear door is now creating an unsafe hazard where the trucks are blocking the travel lanes and it's only a matter of time till somebody gets hit, injured, or killed in that scenario. These large trucks are arriving more than once a week and need to load safely for Abishans. Instead, we have them clogging up the traffic. We were repaving, somebody was repaving that alley and we couldn't arrange to put 20 more feet of pavement down spontaneously in order to make sure the forklift didn't tip and lose a load again. 
I mean, again, these are all reasons we should not renew the city manager's contract. Also missing from the public records are the rights of public access to use the city garage. I talked to an attorney who grew up in Montpelier, who lived here and moved away because of the mismanagement and the high cost of taxes. And he recalls the city center being promised as a public garage and the bathrooms being available was in the paper re recalled by many. Unfortunately, the city manager can't find those records, still refuses to say they don't exist and refuses to respond to an appeal to the head of the agency in compliance with law. Instead, he would rather lie to the city council repeatedly and say he's, he's, he's complied with public records law. The city not having an attorney is ill-prepared. The council is ill-prepared to figure out who's telling the truth. But I've watched this, this manager lie to the council a dozen times at least, and he gets away with it. So also missing are public records regarding the, state, the city's decision not to be a public safety answering point. Now there's money available from the state and we need to revisit that issue. And those records have been requested, appealed, and the manager will not confirm they don't exist because he knows he's likely to get caught in another lie. I've repeatedly raised these issues. Also missing is the cruiser cam video to catch a lying police officer in the act. The Valcors report says the video exists and yet it's missing. He's repeatedly lied to the council on whether he complied and whether or not the council has, anyway, I've already said that part. The silt fence, I'll skip. What's, what's worse is in the long run, the public trust and the extreme cost. Even if we were to bite the bullet and pay the contract severance, the golden parachute that's built into the contract, 150, maybe $200,000 to get rid of this city manager, we'll still be paying for the deferred maintenance which has only gotten more and more costly during the decades of neglect and mismanagement. The infrastructure maintenance has been routinely neglected by this city manager while the infrastructure has been grossly neglected. Appraisals have been skewed in favor of the commercial property owners, the multimillionaires, the result being that the city has been saddling the unfair tax burden on the residential properties and their rental tenants where we are tens of millions of dollars in debt and we will be paying for this city manager's mismanagement for decades to come. So it's time to begin this healing, this recovery, this rejuvenation of Montpelier by first finding a new city manager, one that can be trusted to tell the truth and not sweep police shootings and mismanagement under the rug, not to hide these misallocations of funds, even in the millions of dollars. The manager is charged with hiring, and yet this little city that's so proud of itself has only employed one minority out of 300 employees. How on earth does that happen? So the city manager hires the lawyer that writes his contract, and he approves payment to the lawyer who writes a contract that protects the benefits the city manager for, uh, for the city manager more so than the people of Montpelier who pay the severance pay. At minimum, the decision on this critical and fraught decision because I realize we don't have the support of the votes here, ought to be deferred until a subsequent special meeting, specially convened, an independent attorney should be hired to verify or debunk this short history hey, and maybe strip some of the parachute Steven, benefits you're, out of the contract. You're at like if, 10 minutes right now, and normally we, um, we just go time. with two. Um, so if you could try to wrap it up, that would be great. Okay, if the city manager chooses not to re-up the contract after modified by an independent attorney working for the city, not the manager, fine. He doesn't get his golden parachute. But certainly the golden parachute provision should not be any new contract going forward. And we should be making a plan to transition the new city manager with better integrity as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vicki, go ahead. Um. Um, trying to think of a, a tactful way of putting this. Um, uh, having sat through many of these accusations, uh, my mind kind of turns off after I hear the first word lie. Um, it seems to me as if 
the civility. People make mistakes. Um, I tactfully, I don't know how to put this other than to say that the continual vicious accusations without without um, proof um, don't make me feel sanguine about the views expressed. Um, I'm not, <laughs> um, part of me is doing a slow boil and it's turning to a fast boil and I'm trying very hard not to, um, not to buy into some of the things that I've heard. Uh, I'm just getting really tired of hearing continuous negative things without a whole lot of positive um, suggestions about how things might be changed. I honestly do not believe that the city manager, the chief of police, and God only knows who all else, um, the mayor, the council, and everybody else lies. I do not believe that that is true. Um, I, my lie detector is pretty good. And as far as that past contract thing that, you know, that, that mistake, I remember exactly when that happened. And I remember sitting in the, in the, in the city manager's office and discussing it with him. Um, and there were a lot of things going on at that time that, that, that were very serious uh, personal things going on with the then um, public works director. And that contributed to that mistake happening to, I, I should probably shut up while I'm still at. <laughs> I just can't take it anymore. Well, thank you, Vicki. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I'll just say for, for my part, um, I have found the city manager to be very ethical. Um, and, uh, but um, if there's no, no other comments. Um, um, I will have to say that I applaud each and every one of you when you sit through that and sit through some of the things that have been said and do it with composure because I don't think I could. Well, thank you, Vicki. Um, and we are um, gonna uh, move on to a discussion about uh, city. Oh yes, uh, Bill, go ahead. I, I'm not gonna respond to all of the things that were said. I just for the record would note that um, a few years ago, the city council did in fact hire an attorney that worked for the council and not for the manager to review the contract and that, um, that was done. And the contract that is currently in place is the same contract that was in place then. So the, the, the contractual piece that was requested has happened. Um, and many of the other issues have been reviewed. And uh, it's I, beneath, uh, beneath me to go to his level. Fair enough. And uh, Jack, go ahead. At this point, I think it's appropriate to make a motion pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3. I move that we go into executive se session to uh, consider the appointment, employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee and that we include uh, the city manager in that uh, executive session. Yeah. I'll second it. Um, before we do that, actually, I know we've had a motion in a second, and I um, am feeling a little silly here. Um, there was a suggestion that um, because it, I, I doubt that we're going to get to the point where we have a vote um, uh, at the end of the evening. Um, and so one possibility is that we could go through uh, council reports 
uh, now so that uh, the public, uh, or so, yeah, so that the substantial portion of um, the meeting could be over. Um, what do you what do you think about that, team? Oh, I, just, I suggest yeah. that that would allow Orca to turn off and the, the public Zoom to turn off and um, all of that. Okay. Um, um, so uh, what I guess I'd recommend that we do is, you know, pending, um, unless there's other suggestions as to how to handle this, because there's been a motion in a second. My suggestion would be that we just hang on to that We'll do our council reports and then we'll we'll have a vote um, on that unless folks have other thoughts as to how to handle it. Um, Jack and then Donna, yeah. I could move to lay my motion on the table. Okay. Or you can just say, well, your motion will take effect when the discussion gets done. Yeah, that's I I think I, I think we're fine to go ahead and take uh, take up the other matters before voting on the motion. Okay. Um, all right, so we are gonna do uh, council reports um, first and, uh, oh yes, uh, David Delcor, go ahead. Yeah, I, I appreciate that you doubt that you'll take any action, but that yep. doesn't sound like it's, it's certain. And if you're saying you won't take any action, then, you know, feel free and turn off the Zoom, otherwise, please leave it on. Thank you. Yeah, fair enough. Um, well, about that, um, are we going to take any action? I think it's kind of a question of like how far we get in the discussions this evening. I, I, I would feel comfortable saying that we are not gonna take any action um, coming out of this. Um, uh, other, other thoughts uh, with the anticipation that we might. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I mean, we could just commit ourselves not to. Yeah. No matter what we come out with, we can say that we're going to do it next meeting. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Jack, how do you feel about that? I saw you had a hand. That's fine. I was trying to remember what uh, how we've managed this in uh, in previous years, um, but I don't I don't have a problem with Donna's suggestion. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm just anticipating that we'll come out of executive session and then just adjourn. Um, so we'll, we'll just um, commit that um, to, to you all and to ourselves. Um, does that seem fair, everybody? Just checking one more time. Okay, all right, so thank you for that question. Um, so council uh, reports, I'm gonna go in the order as if we were in the horseshoe, because uh, <laughs> I can't think about doing something different, apparently. Um, uh, Donna, as long as you're happy to go first. I'm, I'm fine, and I'm just gonna say, I want everybody to think about voting. I want people to get absentee ballots and vote early. It really helps the process. And I do want them to support the land bond. And I want them to look beyond the immediate and look out in the future. That this is an opportunity we should say yes to. It fits in our vision, it, it fits in all our planning. And please reach out for more information because it is there. Call me if you wanna know more, thank you. Oh yeah, vote for me. <laughs> also that. Uh, all right, thank you. Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to like uh, thank the DPW staff with all the uh, snowfall over the weekend there. I had, I had a couple of constituents reach out and just say, I was in a jam. And, you know, these guys went above and beyond the call of duty and like, you know, help me, someone elderly. It's uh, so just the outpouring of support. I think it, it, they're always underappreciated, but I, I think in a, a snowstorm, you see it more than ever. Um, similar thanks to uh, MPD. You know, I think we had a pretty sensitive issue on Friday there on Barry Street. And I, I really appreciate the way the department got out in front of it. You know, Jack and I went there for the virtual reality training. Chief Pete said, hey, look at the camera footage, look at the camera footage. And if we're wrong, tell us we're wrong, you know? And, and, and I, you know, I, I think that, you know, just speaks to the character of Chief Pete there uh, and the character of the department and what we like to see. So thanks so much. And uh, uh, yeah, un unopposed, but um, I, I think I'm a bit better than Mickey Mouse for the, uh, the, the council race. So thanks very much. Thank you. All right, Jay. 
Um, yeah, I'll echo uh, Donna and Connor and and the folks that they called out and, and um, supporting the the land acquisition and, and Connor's um, feedback around around the chief and and DPW. And so I appreciate that. I won't I won't be redundant there. I just will add in one one small piece of um, uh, public acknowledgement to the community effort around um, maintaining outdoor recreation and cross-country skiing um, for folks in our community. Um, it's been it's been a pretty you know a new normal with lots of ups, ups and downs with with uh, temperatures and snow and we have a really dedicated group of folks who are out grooming trails um, all voluntarily um, and that just creates just this just an incredible, um, outdoor resource for folks in our community up on North Street uh, at, at the you know golf course um, and in the parks um, and it's it's all you know it's all grassroots community driven um, and I just want to acknowledge all the folks who have, have played a part in making that happen to support not, not just the communities but then also all the school programs um, so I just think that it's important to acknowledge uh, that those efforts that have been having that, that, that have happened rather. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I really just wanted to voice my support for the land acquisition um, as somebody who's not a homeowner in Montpelier because there are no homes to buy that I can afford. Um, the opportunity to um, build affordable housing would be phenomenal um, and it's a hot topic I know on Front Porch Forum. I'm reading the posts every day and um, it's a really interesting conversation and I would encourage folks that maybe don't have the information that they need or want or that's accurate to reach out to your city council person. Um, I know we all like talking about it and um, I just think it would be a very smart move because there are no other places really to develop um, around here and I have lived here for seven years the entire time that I've lived in Montpelier or in Vermont sorry has been here in, in Montpelier and I'm raising my children here and this is where my husband's from and we don't want to move I want to stay here and um, yeah that's what I have to say on that and also I'm running for one more year so please vote for me thanks <laughs> right thank you uh, Jack. Thank you. Um, yes, a couple of things. Uh, <clears throat> one, uh, I want to second what Connor said. Connor and I uh, went over on Friday afternoon uh, to uh, have a demonstration of the virtual reality uh, training uh, set up, and it was uh, any council members who haven't uh, done it yet, it's pretty amazing. You really feel like you're right there in the space in which these events are happening and you have to react very quickly, including when the guy with the weapon comes running at you. And so, uh, <clears throat> so I think it's, uh, it's going to be a real, uh, real plus to the, uh, to the training of the police. And uh, again, we were, in, uh, the chief invited us right into the room where they were watching the video of the interaction with the guy on Barry Street. Um, it looked to me like a, a dangerous situation that uh, police reacted to very quickly and appropriately. And um, as we've had a, been placing a real value on transparency, on uh, getting information open to members of the public as soon as we can. And it was practically in real time. Before I got to the police department at three o'clock, I had already seen the chief's post. So uh, well done for getting the, uh, the information out um, <clears throat> because I think that that does nothing but enhances uh, trust in, in our institutions. Uh, the uh, the other thing I think it's it's very gratifying to see that there's a lot of discussion about the uh, 
items on the ballot, not not only the property property acquisition. Um, I've heard from some constituents. I still have one call that I need to make to uh, get back to somebody. I I think the uh, the posts from the city manager have been. Uh, thorough, extremely informative, and uh, and extremely valuable. I support the proposal, and I hope uh, our voters do. And I will put out uh, some, some of my thoughts on the other items, too. But I don't think we need to do that tonight. I think I'm set. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Lauren. Thank you. Just two quick things and just echo a lot of what you've all already said. Um, so won't believe her that. Um, one thing I was thinking it might be good for the lobbying committee to get together with our lobbyist um, so we could just check in and make sure that they have the information and context and whatever and see if there's any updates or information sharing that would be helpful to make the most of that. Um, so maybe next week or something. Oh, my cat wants to say hi. Um, <laughs> um, and only other thing I wanted to note is I might be, I, I might be out of town for the next meeting. I'm going to um, try to participate, but just to get that um, on your radar in case there's anything that you would need from me ahead of time. And especially was thinking of that's Jay's last meeting. <laughs> um, and maybe we could figure out a way to um, celebrate with Jay sometime. Um, it looks like cases are going down. Maybe we could figure out a way to thank him for his service. And it's been great working with you, but hopefully I'll be with you uh, next meeting. But just in case, wanted to say that. And that's it for me, thanks. Great. Uh, okay, so- um, I'll just throw in real quick. Yeah, I, go ahead. I would, I, I would I absolutely appreciate that opportunity, but just know I'm gonna be in, in the desert in Arizona, zooming in to our next to my last meeting, so uh, it's it's not going to be at the after the next meeting. So let's let's we can look a little bit further down the road. So fair <laughs> enough. Summer, I appreciate summer. The sentiment. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Um. All right. Uh, so I agree with everybody. <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat things that have already been said, um, but I will also add that um, I just want to thank Cameron uh, for this meeting um, in navigating um, yes, bombers. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for doing that. You are a rock star. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, new experiences. Okay, now that's a thing, apparently. And um, we'll just need to be vigilant, I guess, about that. And so, yeah, now we know. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is um, I, before the pandemic hit, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but I actually started, I, I had been doing office hours um, prior to the pandemic and then stopped due to COVID. And so I'm actually gonna be bringing back some virtual office hours um, this, uh, so every Sunday in February, at least, uh, we're gonna try that. So every Sunday uh, at 2 p.m., if you're interested, uh, then email me and I will send you a link. And I think that should help um, uh, <laughs> with um, uh, preventing the, you, you know, the things that happened earlier today. Um, so uh, we'll see. Um, but anyway, so yeah, email me if, if, uh, if you're interested in participating. Happy to talk about anything related to the city. Um, uh, so yeah, that is um, upcoming. Uh, and so on to the city clerk. So John, go ahead. Just want to say that ballots are finally in. So we've had a fair amount of people coming in today to vote. Come on out to vote. Um, we're going to send out, we've got about 200 early ballot requests. So they should all be out by midday tomorrow. So yeah, come on and vote. Great. Uh, and Bill, go ahead. Uh, I don't think I have anything additional than what we've already covered. Okay. Um, Jack, go ahead. Yes, just a question for the clerk, given the fact that it's uh, liquor license season and we passed some liquor licenses today, do we need to get to the police department and sign them physically? Yeah, that's a good point. And the warrants too. Um, they, you know, we were just filing the minutes under the previous emergency order. 
uh, but the emergency order is off, so things need to get signed. I mean, I'll double check on this, but that's my understanding. So everything's waiting at the uh, police department. And boy, is there a lot to sign. <laughs> Prepare yourselves. That's good to know. Thank you for that question. I have to uh, ask, Donna. does that mean we should bring snacks, John? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always up for snacks. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a pending um, motion and a second regarding going into executive session uh, that is going to include the city manager in these discussions uh, about evaluation and contract. Um, any further discussion on this item? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, so uh, and we will not be taking any action when we come back from executive session. Um, so thank you, everybody, and I will um, see many of you anyway in executive session. So for everyone else on the call, this link will be closed. Council will be able to, uh, they'll be able to log back in, but I will no longer be recording it, and it will be closed for everyone else because they're not taking action. We'll be on a different link though, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, just to, for others, people's, yes. Okay, all right, well, um, thanks everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>